I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all my darkness apart. Heaven came down, glory filled my soul. Sunday school announcement time's good to be back. Uh, glad you glad you came. Ain't it wonderfully cool this morning? Wonderfully cool. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, you're you're cool. You're always cool, right? G Gary and Candy are here. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, glad that glad that you, you you finally got back. And we hope everything goes back to normal very quickly. I think we just need to keep praying, and God will do that. But let's pray, and the rest of you being here, God bless you. And I like your jacket, I tell you. Do you think I, the, preach, the church ought to buy me a glittery jacket like that I can wear on Sunday morning? Would that be all right? Uh, we, hey, we got an exciting Sunday. This is award Sunday for our school kids. And there's, they're going to they're gonna say, show me the money. And uh, they, they've made some money this past week, past quarter. Uh, but uh, uh, let's pray. We've got uh, Sheila Parker fell Thursday Possibly broke a rib, went to the hospital again today because it was uh, agonizing. I've been told that rib damage is absolutely the worst pain in the world. So pray for Sheila. Also, uh, Miss Sue still in the hospital. The last that I that I was uh, I contacted her, um, and it's just going to be you know time for her to heal. Uh, also for Miss Patsy uh, or Patty, which is uh, Dana's sister, had triple bypass, and she is uh, recovering and did well through the surgery. I have not talked to her, but we do. I want you to start praying now for the preaching. I told the men, asked the men to do this. For the, the God gave me a message for this hour or for the preaching hour to try if the right folks will be here, right folks will listen. I mean, it's for everybody, but there's some help in the book, you know. It's kind of like uh, it's a buffet, uh, but some people just go to the dessert line. Now you got to go around and get your greens, amen. And I, when I was young, I didn't like collard greens. When I got I got older, a big hoop scoop full of collard greens on top of a uh, a piece of uh, cornbread, and then I, then this black lady I work with, she said, "Get you some pot liquor." Y'all know what pot liquor is? I said, "That you can't say that as a Christian." 
And because it has the word liquor, and that's just the juice and the, the pot liquor, amen. But, uh, and it's good. And then, oh, you got to put vinegar, cider vinegar, a little hot salt. How many of y'all are hungry for collard greens now? Amen. I, hallelujah. Well, let's, <laughs> let's pray. Father, thank you for our church. Thank you for the liberty that we have to, to be here. Uh, Lord, the uh, healing power that comes through your name. Thank you for our friends and guests that are here, uh, family members that are visiting other family members and uh, young people here. Thank you for bus ministry, those that work. Uh, thank you for those that worked on the fence this week and worked so hard at the church. Thank you for uh, the internet being up. And Lord, uh, folks coming to church and Brother John teaching in my uh, absence, Lord, bless him and bless him as he brings a message uh, for Sunday school today. Uh, Lord, would you be with those folks we've asked for for prayer? And we, we ask you, Lord, that you would deliver us from evil. Uh, God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And God, we pray that you rebuke the devil today. And if there's someone here that's lost, that they would truly get born again, someone here that's, that's hiding behind sin, and Lord, maybe can't feel like they can get, get out of sin, that you give them that liberty to step from, from the darkness into light. God, do that work that only you can do, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Anybody have, need a bulletin? Raise your hand. We actually got color, color toner again. Uh, anybody need a bulletin? Raise your hand. Everybody has a bulletin. Y'all done well. Um, uh, so before we get into the bulletin, I do want to tell you, in the, in the bookstore now, uh, Miss Candy was so kind. She she orders these as she does card ministry herself. But she, I asked her to order a few more for the bookstore. I think raw cost is four dollars. Is that what you said? So we're, that's all we're asking. If you want good Christian King James greeting cards, there's a variety. I think there's like two of each box or something like that. And maybe there, I don't know, maybe twenty boxes or something back in there. But Abby or whoever's working, that's four dollars. That's just cover. That's raw cost. That's what you would pay. But it keeps you from having to go to the bookstore and trying to find a King James Bible greeting card. And uh, I know I've done it before where you, you, you have to get something that has some of you scratch it out and you put the KJV. But uh, this this gives you options. And they're actually, they're very pretty. They're very, uh, this is, uh, there's three three different style cards in this particular one. Look at that. You ladies just go, ooh, ah. Men are like, We'll, we'll, we'll let you. <laughs> and then also, uh, um, my friend uh, Bill Vaughn at Highland Baptist Church, um, I think it's been a couple years ago, his, his two, they look about um, maybe eight, eight, to eight and 12 year old granddaughters were killed tragically in a car wreck and just horrific. I mean, it really, if there's a man that uh, has, uh, um, you know, the Bible says we're peculiar people. He has a peculiarness. When he, when he comes, when he mounts the pulpit, as they say in old fashion, he takes his shoes off. He lays a sheepskin over the, over the, uh, the pulpit. He just has, he has a way. He's very, and, and just a godly man. And you think, God, why would you allow that to happen? I mean, it shook, it rocked their church and the world. You imagine just, uh, and he wrote a gospel track uh, called They Finished Early. And, and across the top, it says they finished early, and thanks be to God, they finished well. The, the, those two young ladies, were they, they passed, but they uh, passed from death into life, and they were saved. And so I've got a few of those on my desk, if you'd like to read that, and just maybe you know somebody that's lost uh, loved ones tragically too early, uh, as we would see. Um, maybe that'll help them. But uh, homecoming is just right around the corner. It is October 4th, uh, and then our revivals that week. Uh, we have Brother uh, uh, J.D. Walker back with us. Well, well, hello, preacher. How are you? Good to see you. I, I forgot your name, brother. Uh, oh, I don't know you. You look like somebody else. <laughs> You're my brother in the Lord. You, hey, at least you got it. At least you got that look, right? You didn't come in and say, well, and I didn't say you were a youth pastor, amen, but no, uh, uh, brother uh, Jordan, you said uh, Harshbury from, and you're from where? From Colorado to hear me preach? Sure. God bless you. Just for you. <laughs> uh, how is the uh, the great state of Colorado? Is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was real close to saying so, but you know, some I don't know. Uh, uh, was it you, Keely, or Abby? Was saying there was people that hold up signs that says, "I'm I'm a Christian." And, and I'm, what was it, where's Keith? He's not here. And I'm, 
I'm Republican, but I'm voting Democrat. And I thought, it, it's not, a, to me, it's not between Republican and Democrat. It's between whether you want to kill people or not. And that's, anyway, but we won't get into that. Welcome, Coloradians. Uh, are you originally from there? I'm originally from South Carolina. Okay. Uh, God bless you. Where'd you go? Did you go to school over in the South? I went to school in Oklahoma City, South Carolina. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. And good to see you, your your significant other, uh, your wife. My, what was, where were we at? We were at a uh, preacher's meeting one time, and, and uh, they said, asked all the past preachers to stand. And, and, uh, and well, I, 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 I remember standing. I don't remember hardly anything. I've been gone all week. I've been in revival. And uh, I, I said my name, but I didn't introduce my wife, and they made me feel bad. So I'm going to make you feel bad. You didn't introduce, introduce your wife. But God bless you, sis. Um, treat, them, treat them really nice. Give, give them handshakes. Uh, anyway, our homecoming, and we have sign-up sheets out there for feeding the preacher and the singers like we've always done the past few years. Hopefully, we, we'll, we'll, we can decide whether we want to do it over here, you know, set up because it's smaller, or, or just have it over there, uh, feeding after church like we did in years past. Um, and uh, you can uh, help out with that. Um, and the, uh, Eric Oss will, uh, singers will be here. Uh, we do have junior church today. <laughs> uh, four to eight after uh, service after um, offering backside of your bulletin uh, with these hands ministries tomorrow they're meeting today they're not here this morning are they I hope they're okay oh okay and then the uh, ladies meeting is uh, next Tuesday the 22nd men's prayer breakfast how was the ladies prayer breakfast did y'all have it did you have a great prayer I kind of felt a little you know like y'all talking about me so I don't know. That's good. First ladies prayer break. Uh, so that was good. So suppose if we're in the building, if we're in the building by next month, Lord willing, amen, y'all pray and it will happen. You show up and help, it'll happen. Uh, the, the men will fix you breakfast. Is that how we're going to do it? And, and ladies, you'll fix us our breakfast. <clears throat> that's good. I want T-bone steak and eggs. Now that's what you get. At the, the, they call it the, uh, the hovel house, right? Or awful house. Anyway, just a little side note. I offended some of y'all. Y'all like that, right? That's that's a it'll do if you're really hungry, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see. And then uh, stock the kitchen uh, to the new building. Uh, Saturday, t the uh, 26th, 7 p.m., having that uh, pounding for the, the uh, church. I heard that the, the, it's, the church has inherited a kitchen aid, brand new kitchen aid mixture. Is that right, Susan? Or is that somebody, or was that somebody's house? Brand new. Huh. So we make sure nobody says, can I borrow that permanently? Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, help out with that. Now, listen, I, I need you all to pray also uh, during the, this, the rain and all that that come uh, through this uh, the, the tropical storm. The, the, the tile or the, the pipe, the three-foot pipe that runs drainage from on the other side, uh, right there at the, basically it runs the, the, from the asphalt uh, to the rock. Uh, it's starting to cave in. In other words, it's starting to break down. It's 15 years old or 16 years old, and it's, uh, uh, I guess it's due for that. So that's, I'm going to get uh, a, a price on it this week or try to. That's going to be at least six thousand dollars, at least. I imagine it might be more because that's uh, it goes from the road all the way back over here. So that's uh, over a hundred, maybe one hundred fifty foot of pipe, and then you're going to have to get a track hoe, dig it all up, dig all the other junk out, you know, pitch it and all that stuff, and put it together. So pray, pray. We don't necessarily have to do it like tomorrow, but uh, um, we want to make sure that we can afford to do it. Uh, with that, with your giving, and thank you for those that do give, but we, we are getting to the place where um, uh, we don't have lots of excess anymore in the sense that we're paying things out and things are being paid off, and uh, uh, we're going to need to buy uh, plants maybe this week. Uh, we're gonna need, it has to be this week, I guess, if we're going to get in, and then gravel. Gravel, we're going to have to have probably, I don't know, a, a bunch of truckloads of, for rock to go out there. So please help if you can. Uh, if you can't help financially, you can certainly pray and say, Lord, uh, would you make a way? You know how God works that out? God will, uh, sometimes God would uh, maybe put on the heart of the truck driver or the company, you, you, hey, I'll donate some of this or whatever. I, I believe there was somebody that had a, 
had a truckload of dirt delivered because of, uh, because they got one to get rid of a boat, right, Miss? Uh, uh, it's it's amazing that uh, what can happen. A tree fall on boat, boats total, you get free load of dirt, and fifty dollars. June, that's just amazing. That's just awesome. So, uh, anyway, uh, God's good all the time. So we're looking forward to to this service and looking forward to God saving folks, delivering folks. Helping folks. We we we're gonna take out snakes tonight. So today, preacher, is that all right? No, just kidding. <laughs> He's good South Carolinian, amen. Uh, copperheads or cottonmouths, amen. Are you from South Carolina too? Uh, I mean, your wife. I, uh, okay, good. I'm just. I, I don't want to embarrass you. Uh, you. You're embarrassed enough with him. No, I I feel like you're my brother in Christ, amen. Let's let's do responsive reading. Ready? Uh, we'll back up First Timothy. Where are we at? First Timothy 1, 11 through 20. Okay. According to the glorious gospel, the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in my curse Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Now unto the eternal, a King eternal, immortal, visible, the only wise God, be glory or honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit the son Timothy according to the prophecies which went before thee that thou holding faith and uh, a good conscience which some have put away concerning faith have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may not are not to blaspheme. Little, you notice he said that uh, Paul was talking to Timothy. He said, delivered him. They just gave him over and said, hey, there's sometimes, sometimes you just have to say, let, Satan's got to just have it sift them so they learn not to blaspheme. So that's, that's a little, little thought for you. All right, it's Sunday school time. We'll dismiss for Sunday school. Uh, kids, you can go to your classes and Adults, uh, uh, you stay in here. Good morning. I got to turn this on. Ah, there I am. Good morning again. Okay, he's he's left the room, so you're safe now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we are for those visitors uh, certainly welcome. You're our honored guests for a adult Sunday school class. Um, I will say that we are in the middle of preparing for revival. You heard Pastor mention that October 4th. We're starting our revival week services, our meetings. And for those that are visiting, we, we've gone through uh, on Wednesday night a preparation for revival. And last Sunday's Adult Sunday School was part one of the Soul Winner's Testimony. Uh, this week, we are continuing that lesson in part two of the soul winner's testimony. I will take a moment, since I mentioned Wednesday night's um, lesson, and say that I need to clear something up. No one brought this to my attention, by the way, but 
I, I did, as I was speaking on Thursday night, I, what, what happened was I kind of confused two thoughts, and that happens in my head sometimes, and my mouth speaks, I'm thinking something else, but I say something completely different. I don't know if that's because I'm getting older or what the story is there, but I'm certainly finding that I'm doing that more often than not. In order not to confuse any, uh, anyone with a statement that I made, I, I want to clarify. Preparing for revival, obviously, is important. And as an example of pre uh, preparation, I referenced the 3,000 souls that was sa being saved in, in Acts. The apostles met together, you'll remember, in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. They even appointed a 12th apostle to replace Judas, uh, Matthias. I said that Jesus was still walking the earth and had not, I didn't say this, but uh, I made the, if you were listening, and I checked this on the, on, the, on the tape, I went back to the tape, the Holy Spirit said, yeah, go review the tape, make sure you understand what you were saying, and then clarify with the, with the, uh, with the uh, group when you go in on Sunday. Anyway, I said that Jesus was... Uh, still walking the earth at that time and, and had not ascended to the Father. But obviously we are in Acts, so he had ascended to the Father already. So again, nobody called me out on that. I will tell you that the Holy Spirit called me out on that and said you need to go in and clarify that just in case anyone picked up on that and, and, and may uh, don't want to confuse anyone. So anyway, let's open with a word of prayer. Brother Aubrey, would you open us up in prayer? Amen. Thank you, brother. Let's open with our normal short story. An 80-year-old couple was worried because they kept forgetting things all the time. The doctor assured them there was nothing seriously wrong except their aging. He suggested that they carry a notebook and write things down so they wouldn't forget. Several days later, the old man got up to go to the kitchen. His wife said, dear, get me a bowl of ice cream while you're up. Okay, he said and put some chocolate syrup on it and a few cherries, too. You better write all this down, by the way. I won't forget. Don't worry. Fifteen minutes later, man came back to his wife, um, and he handed his wife a plate of scrambled eggs and bacon. She glared at him. Now, I told you to write it down. I knew you'd forget. He said, what did I forget? She said, my toast. <laughs> Last week we covered in lesson one of sharing your personal testimony a few things. We covered how to create a desire in a prospect, how to take away objections, uh, how to cause people to examine their own lives, how to manifest the presence of Christ, and how to prepare the heart to receive the word of God. Let's take a look again. We covered a couple verses last week. We're going to look at them again, refreshing our mind. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. All right. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, I'll read that for you, says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We talked about how we have a job to do as well. Amen. Part of that great commission, bringing the gospel to all those, not only in your community, 
but to the uttermost. But let's focus on what we can do individually as we share the gospel. Those folks at work that you speak to, those folks that you come across at the while you're shopping, while you're sitting in a McDonald's, wherever you are, wherever you are in life, whether you're retired, whether you're still working, you have the opportunity to share the gospel. And we need to get busy at sharing the gospel. Other than the word of God, nothing is more powerful in soul winning than your testimony. The testimony of what God has done for you. Your testimony is what gives you the right to bring out your Bible. And our goal is to get out the Bible and win souls for Christ. Christ does the saving. Nevertheless, we are to share the gospel. Someone once said, I believe in carrying a concealed weapon. I don't think they were talking about a 9mm or 380, but I think that they were talking about carrying around the Word of God with them. Amen. Avail yourself of the opportunity to carry around the Word of God so that you have your weapon at the time when it's required. Having come out of law enforcement, I can tell you that there is a frequent nightmare that most police officers have. I can tell you I've had this nightmare as well, and this, I'm, I'm not kidding about this. Um, that nightmare involves having an altercation on the street and realizing you don't have your weapon with you. That is terrifying. Just think of it in terms of sharing the gospel, though. I do not have the greatest memory. I think I just indicated that, and my mind sometimes wanders, and I'm thinking of something, but different words come out of my mouth. So I think it's important for me to carry the word of God with me so that if the opportunity does arise and the Holy Spirit is leading, that I'm prepared, be prepared. The Bible is a powerful book. You can walk in to any place with a big Bible, and no matter where you put it in the room, people will watch the Bible. They wonder, what's going to happen next? The Bible, to some people, is a very intimidating book. People, believe it or not, in certain circumstances, and in just certain people, I will say, are afraid of the Bible because they simply don't know what it says. We've learned to carry a New Testament, as I just showed you, in your pocket or in your purse, where people do not see it. We know that they are not going to relax and let down the walls if they think you are going to preach to them rather than having a conversation with them. Let's talk about how we are to set up our testimony. Now, we're continuing from last week. We must and being led by the Holy Spirit, I will say, we must talk to everybody, everybody. We call it, well, let's say I've heard in the South, and you, you, you could tell, brother, I may not be the most uh, Southern-sounding person. <laughs> I am from New York City originally, and I've been, been here in North Carolina for just over 15 years. As my father would say, I, I moved to God's country. <laughs> Uh, in the South, I hear the term folksy. Well, they're really folksy over at that church. Well, being folksy means we just chit-chat. People are open to conversation. We talk about anything that we want to talk about. The weather, their children, grandchildren, work. You might try to avoid the subject of politics today. You might try and avoid that, especially when you're trying to share your testimony. Um, be careful what you talk about, I will say. If you have cats and you're not a big cat lover, for example, you might want to keep your opinion to yourself because you may be talking to the chairman or chairwoman of the Cat Lovers of America United. So me not being the biggest cat fan, let's say, I would not go up and say, boy, I really can't stand cats. I'm a dog lover. <laughs> 
folksy time. It's time to find out what makes these people tick, get to know them, what they are living for, what their goals in life are. I know that sounds like a lot, but you'd be amazed when you engage people in conversation about how much people want to share their life. It really is amazing. It's time to give your testimony when you have a burden for these people that you meet. When you can honestly say, I want God, I want God to save these people. Amen. I am concerned about them. You've come to understand them and you will want to help them. Obviously, you're led by the Holy Spirit once you are burdened for them. We set up our testimony by, by what? By making a request. The request is not offensive, but it is a request where people just unload their wagon, let's say. We set it up like this sometimes. And I'm going to be giving examples, and this is not an end-all, be-all, um, but we are kind of in uh, sharing the gospel 101 because we're leading up to revival. And we want to make sure that, that everyone within Bible Baptist Church has an idea, especially I look at this lesson as helping me understand better how to share the gospel, let's say. So there may be some basics here. You might want to say, tell me a little bit more about yourself, getting to know the person. Tell me about your church background. Now, I will tell you this, coming from New York City, people don't normally talk about, can I say religion or church, because there's so many uh, broad spectrum of faiths in New York City, it's a melting pot. But I, I did learn something when, I, when we moved to North Carolina, and even in doing business, I'll tell you, the first time that I met with banking executives and we bowed our heads uh, to pray at a uh, lunch that we were having, myself and, and a colleague of mine who flew in from New York City, we both looked at each other and we were, I was, that's great. Amen. The other fella happened to be a Jewish fella. He was not offended in the least, which actually made me feel a lot more comfortable. He said, that was very nice. That was his reaction. The moment this type of question is asked, you may have a, a partner with you, and we'll, we'll refer to that partner as the silent partner if you're doing the majority of the speaking. The silent partner is no longer engaged in the conversation. They take a little bit of a back seat if you're working with somebody. Could be a wife, could, you know, a husband and wife speaking with another couple or whatever it is. To be the silent partner, I know this would be tough for me if Miss Janice is talking to, to folks and the Lord is leading her because, you know, being in sales for a long time, I love to talk. I love to, I don't know what it is. Maybe I like to hear myself. But I have to pray, quite, quite frankly, the Holy Spirit, keep, keep my mouth shut. Keep my mouth shut. It's not my time to speak right now. The, the silent partner must be silent. I know a man who was uh, the silent partner until the one doing the witnessing got to the point of sharing the plan of salvation. Then he spoke up and tried to, uh, let's see, we were talking in the prayer room about fishing a lot. He tried to land the fish, okay? Such silent partners might want to be avoided in the future by soul winners when you're out sharing the gospel. If your partner is wanting to talk, you may not be able to lead that person to Christ. There could be a hindrance there. The prospect's questions. They're going to ask you questions. Often the prospect will ask questions that may sidetrack him or her in presenting the gospel sometimes even intentionally or unintentionally. The best response, the best response that we have is, that's a good question. If you remind me when I get through, I'll do my best to answer it. Simple, simple. Usually someone wants to know where Cain got his wife or where the dinosaurs went or, you know, that type of thing. Don't let such questions move you from presenting the gospel. Remember, we did our eight lessons, eight, seven or eight lessons on the strategies of Satan, okay? Trying to jump in there and confuse things and confuse the person you're trying to share the gospel with, that's not uncommon. 
you can, as I said earlier, ask about their church background. You might want to lead in with, well, that's interesting. Tell me a little more about yourself. Tell me about your church background. Try to get them to talk a little bit about that as well. It's not an offensive question, as I just mentioned. Most people are not put on edge by it, most people. What are you likely to hear? What are some of the responses you may hear? Well, when I was little, my parents made me go to church. I don't think people ought to be made to go to church. I've heard that. You might hear, I've never been much of a churchgoer, or I used to go to church, but every preacher I met lied, cheated, or stole. The old bad example, so I'm not going to go. I'm not going to follow Christ, because other people are, what do we all say? What do they all say? Hypocrites. Right. One man told the soul winner that eventually led him to the Lord that he used to say, I'll tell you what my church background is. I speak in tongues. Uh-oh, uh-oh. If you're a Baptist, you may get into a whole uh, theological discussion on that. Don't fall into that. Don't fall into that conversation. Stick with the gospel of Christ. Remember, you cannot get off the track. You must listen to them so you can share your testimony and begin to share the story of God's love. That's the focus. Tell them, tell them about your church background. When they are finished, it's a common courtesy for them to listen to your church background. It's just kind of how we're, we're made. Someone speaks, they finish speaking. Well, guess what? It's your turn, and they're going to listen to you, and that's the opportunity you want to share. Say something like, that's really interesting. I really appreciate that. I'm glad to see you're interested in spiritual things. Now, let me tell you a little about myself and about my church background. That's a good lead-in. Concentrate your testimony on the parts of his or her life that you can relate to before you were saved. If, if he, as the example I, I shared with you a moment ago, ran away from preachers, tell how you ran away from God before you were saved. Try to keep your testimony to about two minutes. Don't go on and on and on and on. Try to keep it, you know, in, um, in the sales world, in the, in the business world, you have different, I'm going to use a bad term here, but you have, and it's not, it's just a bad term, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but some salesy folks uh, use this term, but it's, how do you pitch your product? And I'm not saying that the gospel is a product, that's, that's God's word, okay? Um, but nevertheless, in, in the corporate world, you have what's known as the elevator speech. Has anyone ever heard of that, the elevator speech? How long do you think you're in an elevator when you're in a corporate office? Maybe a minute or so? Maybe as it stops at different floors? So try to get, have at least one, two minutes of your testimony prepared in your mind to be able to share. Let me give you some warnings. These warnings are related to you sharing your life before receiving Christ. Don't preach during your testimony time. Don't quote scripture during your testimony. That time will come. Soon you'll have your Bible out, hopefully. Don't talk about going where there was preaching. Avoid asking questions of the prospect as you're giving your testimony, because that that becomes, we're back to a conversation, and that's going to throw your testimony off a bit. Certainly, you've heard it from this pulpit and Pastor Chris, don't brag on the devil. Too often we think we must relate the sins of our lives in such specific terms that the prospect will identify with us. Especially if you meet someone and Listen, I've met people in the morning just out for a, a morning walk that look like they've been out all night long. I think uh, 
you know, some of the men in this room can, can honestly say that they've met people that you, you, you're talking to them and you smell the alcohol on their breath. You know where they've been all night. And they may just be waking up, they may, you know, from sleeping for about an hour and a half, two hours, whatever the case is, whatever the case is. You don't want to go down that road and explain, hey, you know, I was just like you. That's okay up to a certain point, but you certainly don't want to brag on the devil. You don't want to say things like, well, hey, I used to do drugs. You know, big hug. No, that's not what the Holy Spirit wants you to do there. We don't want to brag on that. Quite frankly, you may have read the prospect wrong. And that person may say, whew, I'm not that bad. I don't need what that person needs because I was never that bad. Okay, so be careful with that. Um, some good ideas. Just speak from the heart. We have the Holy Spirit residing within our heart. If we speak from the heart, that gives the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to share. I have spoken... To folks, I have spoken on the phone to family members. I don't know where certain verses pop into my head. At least that's, you know, what I think at first. And then I realize that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Try to remember what it's like to be lost. If you've been saved for a very long time, remember what it was like to be lost. Identify with the person you're seeking to win to the Lord. Say things that will tell the prospect there's a difference between your life and his and her life. Perhaps lead in with, let me tell you a little about myself and my church background, as I said before, before I came to know the Lord, and then give an example. This is, this is a much better lead in than before I got saved. Okay? Janice and I were talking and she gave me permission to say this last night, by the way. Janice and I were talking to some folks down at the, um, uh, down near the beach. There's a little gazebo area that we go, and we, have, we sit there and have our lunch. Well, we had the opportunity to share the gospel, or Janice had the opportunity to share the gospel with one couple when I had stepped away for a moment. And um, I will say, we have to watch out for Christian jargon Okay, words like um, saved to a Catholic that's visiting from New York City. Sometimes they don't, I don't, what is that? What do you say? What do you mean? What does that mean? Now, sometimes that's good to get them to ask a question, but sometimes often we get the deer in the headlights. Look, now the jargon that Janice used the other day was, oh, I have a track. Can I get that for you? Amen. Now, that's awesome. But again, these people were from Connecticut, or I can't remember where they were from. I don't remember. Uh, somewhere up north. But whatever it was, they looked at each track. They're going to get me a track of what? <laughs> Are we going on a hunt? What's the track? So be careful with our Christian jargon. We all know what, what we say when, when we're here corporately, what that means. But when we're sharing the gospel, Share from your heart. Talk to people as if, you know, honestly, they don't have a clue. Because how many times have we said it in this adult Sunday school class? The only Bible that some people have ever read or will ever read is you. Okay, so honestly, there are quite a few people that don't have a clue. Okay? Um, you can add things like, before I came to know the Lord, there was an emptiness in my life. That's fine. Emptiness is something to which everyone can relate, especially now. Especially now with so many folks staying inside their homes, sheltering in place, that type of thing. You can talk about having no peace, no purpose, no direction in your life before you were saved. People can relate to that no matter who they are. You could say, you know, I wasn't as bad as I could have been, but I was as bad off as anybody can possibly be. I was lost without a savior. My life was like a merry-go-round. Sometimes I'd get off at the same place. Sometimes I would lose ground. Let the Holy Spirit help you. 
If you come to an expensive home with a camper, a boat, material things all over the place, you might be able to honestly say, I had everything to live with. Everything. But I had nothing to live for. That is how you can relate to some people in that position. There was such an emptiness there. I tried to fill that emptiness with things. I bought many things, but that emptiness never got filled. Maybe it got filled for the moment I was per making that purchase, let's say. But then the emptiness came back. There was something missing. How you became a Christian is what you're going to share next. Always, at this point, include the Bible in this second part of your testimony. Well, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you did not get saved the Bible way, you did not get saved. I know of some who got saved sitting on 42nd Street listening to a street preacher in the middle of Times Square. Okay? I have seen people get saved in that setting with hundreds of thousands of people walking around. That is God working. You may have seen people get saved on the beach by someone sharing their testimony with someone. Whatever the case is, the Holy Spirit is working is working. I know of some people that got saved, getting back to the track, I know of some people that got saved by reading a gospel track. You must hear or read the Word of God in order to be saved. Remember that you are setting up the opportunity at this point to take out the Bible. You can continue on in your conversation with, but one day somebody cared enough about me to take out a Bible and show me what was missing in my life. I can tell you from personal experience, that happened to me. That happened to me as a teenager in New York City. Someone cared enough for me that they said, can I, I'm still friends with the man, I, I mention him all the time, can I show you from the Bible what I mean so that you're not just taking my word for it. Sure. Three main objections that you may hear, because we will at times hear objections. Here's three main objections. Well, no one could know for sure, or it's too personal. Remember, we talked about these three objections in, in our first lesson. And then there's always that sarcastic comment, that wise guy, that joker. Well, I can relate to that because I'm kind of like that person. Um, here's some reactions to those three. Now, I'm glad when they did that. I wasn't a wise guy. I could have been. I'm glad I didn't act like that, like I knew everything there was to know because that's not the kind of person or actually, I should say, that is the kind of person I could be sometimes. And also, I'm glad I met somebody who knew for sure he was going to heaven. I never met anyone like that who knew for sure. These are things that you might want to share. And do you know what? I'm glad that day that I didn't think it was too personal to talk about. Because I met somebody who cared about me and cared enough to show me what was missing in my life. If you were saved at a very young age, you may be able to use both your testimony and the testimony of your parents as well. Like, I had the privilege of coming to know the Lord when I was a very small child, and the reason is when my dad was 26 years old, he realized that something was missing in his life. You can actually use your parents' testimony as well, or your grandparents' testimony, if you were led to the Lord by a grandma or a grandpa. Sometimes you'll talk to an individual who says that they do not believe the Bible or that they do not understand the Bible. 
this is not the time to talk about the preservation of the Scriptures. But you can say, do you know how I know the Bible is true? I did what the Bible said to do, to have peace and forgiveness. And it worked. Amen. I have peace and forgiveness. That's really hard to argue with when someone says that. <laughs> what it means today, now that you're a Christian, now that you're a Christian, think about what it means today to be a child of God. That is the real test of whether Christ is real in your life. This is what we need to share as we share our testimonies. Since that day, my life hasn't been the same. That emptiness has been filled. God has given me a purpose. He has given me joy and peace. He has given me something to live for. Is every day Reese's peanut butter cups and a bouquet of flowers coming from my spouse? No. No. But I'm telling you, I have joy and peace in my heart. And it all began when someone cared enough about me to ask me one of the most important questions anyone will ever ask. And if I may, I'd like to ask you that question. There you go. There's the opportunity. Not all, but most people will hang on that last statement. What's he going to ask me? What's she going to ask me? I want to know what that question is that impacted this person's life so much. God forbid that we should die and step out into eternity. That's impactful. Always say we. Relate to the person. So he or she will know you aren't just singling them out as being different from others. Oh, you're different from me. We know that there's a truth to that. But you're trying to relate to the person, and you can relate to the person because you were no different than that person last year, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever the case may be. This statement speaks. It speaks for caring for others. You've heard this before, and I, I've heard many use this. If you died today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? Or do you have some doubts? It's a great question. Even a nod of your head, even a nod of your head while you're talking will encourage him or her to be honest with you. That's a safe, that it's safe to answer your question. Most likely you will know if, if he or she has doubts before this time, because you've already had this con a harsh portion of this conversation, and you've heard the background story there. Well, you might want to say, I appreciate you being honest with me. Do you have a few moments in which I could take a Bible, there's the Bible, and show you how you can know for sure and remove all of those doubts? Simple. Now we're there. The phrase, remove all those doubts, is a great phrase. Because that's the goal of sharing the gospel with him or her. If he says he has no doubts, ask him, do you have a Bible reason for believing that you're going to heaven? Could you share that with me? Listen to the response. Then add, wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful for you to have a Bible reason for believing that you're going to heaven? Can I show you how I have a Bible reason? And then turn the pages. Remember, the goal is to get the Bible out. Remember, too, this is the book of the ages, and it still makes people a little bit uncomfortable at times. It's a mirror. Remember, the Bible has been described as being a mirror. It reveals to a person who they really are. We want to gently remove that barrier, every wall that they put up. You might want to say, as you know, the Bible is a book of many books. The book of Genesis tells us about the beginning. The book of Revelation tells us about the ending. And the book of Romans tells us how we can know for sure we can go to heaven 
and how we can remove all the doubts. Now you're pulling your Bible out. You're turning to the first scripture you will probably use. Normally, I'll turn to Romans 3.23. Then you can begin presenting the five steps to heaven. The five steps. Acknowledge that you have sinned. Now, again, to those in this room, this may be gospel sharing 101, but we're going to go through it. The five steps to heaven. Acknowledge you've sinned, as I just said. You can read Romans 3.10 or Romans 3.23, and it's a good idea to mark your Bible at Romans 3.23 so you could find the first verse very quickly. I actually, if I don't, I don't mind sharing this, and I don't do that. I'm not boasting here. I'm just sharing with you what I do. I, because I'm not the smartest person. <laughs> I, I keep my little tab, right, right there, and then I actually keep a couple of tracks in that spot, because I'll put those and I'll move them to the side, as well as I'm going through there. And then I have my next verse written right at the bottom there. Okay, that helps me because again, I am not the sharpest tack in the drawer and I can easily get confused and I'll be jumping to the end before I hit the middle. Okay, there are some things that you have to know and believe before you can go to heaven. First, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You explain that. They must be able to identify with both the sins and God's holiness there. Emphasize that all men are sinners. That I'm a sinner. Because I'm saved does not mean that I am sinless. But I strive with the Holy Spirit's help to sin less. And when I do sin, I confess my sin. And I know the Lord forgives me and hears me. Number two, realize there is a penalty for your sin. Read Romans 6.23, at least the beginning of Romans 6.23. Not only, that, not only that, John, I'll speak to myself, I'll use myself, but the Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The word death means separation, John. Do you know that? The death referred to here means eternal separation from God. In the lake of fire, as stated in that book I mentioned earlier, that's the ending of the Bible in Revelation. And then you could share Revelation if you want. Number three, acknowledge that Christ paid the penalty of sin for you. Read Romans 5.8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The word commendeth, as we read the King James Bible, some folks are not, you know, so up to date on their old English. <laughs> but you might want to explain, commendeth means demonstrated his love for us while we were yet sinners. He demonstrated his love for us. Christ died for us, proving he loves us. Step four, acknowledge that Christ wants to give you the free gift of eternal life in heaven. Read Romans 6.23, the second half of the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Show him the difference between wages, that which we earn and deserve, versus a gift, that which we do not deserve. God's gift of eternal life is free to us, although it cost him a great deal his only begotten son. Step five, acknowledge that Christ wants to give you the free gift of eternal life in heaven. Read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The Bible says that there are two parts of us involved in making this decision. The mouth, the mind we're thinking, the mouth is the part of us that knows, that knows it. And the heart, the heart is the part of us that believes it. You see, it's not enough to know it. 
It's not enough just to know it. You have to believe. You have to trust Jesus Christ. Then read Romans 10.13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's put your name in there and make this personal. For if John shall call upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. Conclude the plan of salvation by reviewing those five steps. And maybe you might want to lead with a prayer as an example. Here's one way to lead in a prayer. We know that you must ask Christ to save you. The Bible says, whosoever. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that if you turn to Christ in faith and ask Christ to save you, he will? Sure he will. I think we should pray now. This is just a set of lessons that are noteworthy of study. Just to refresh yourself. If you're not, and I speak for myself, if you're not practicing soul winning as often as we should, like myself, this was an excellent reminder of how to be prepared. How to be prepared. It's the best way to bring someone to the point that they will genuinely listen to the gospel with a receptive heart. I will say, the time is short, church. The time is short. We're here to work for the Lord. That's what we started with. Remember, the Lord is still saving people today. We must be at the business of sharing the gospel of Christ so that He can reap the harvest. So that he can reap the harvest. Again, this was this was there was a lot of basics here. There was a lot of basics here, but I want to thank you for listening to today's lesson. We'll conclude with a short story as I have one minute to go. A man walking along a California beach was deep in prayer when all of a sudden he said aloud, "Lord, grant me my request, please." The sky clouded and a booming voice said. Because you have tried to be faithful, I will hear your request. The man said, build a bridge to Hawaii so I can drive over anytime I want. It's a heck of a prayer. The Lord answered, your request is very materialistic. Think of the logistics of that kind of undertaking. The supports required to reach into the bottom of the Pacific, the concrete, steel it would take. I can do it, but it is hard for me to justify your desire for worldly things. Take a little more time to think of something that is not so selfish, something that you would think would honor and glorify me. The man thought for a long time and finally said, Lord, I wish that I could understand my wife. I want to know what she feels, what she is thinking when she gives me the silent treatment, why she cries, what she means when she says nothing, when I ask her what's wrong, and how I can make her truly happy. After a moment, God said, how many lanes do you want on that bridge? (laughs) It's a joke. We covered a very serious topic, but we did want to conclude with a joke. It is a joke. Brother Ken, would you close us in prayer, please? Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house today. Lord, we thank you for answering the prayer. Father, we thank you for your
Amen. Amen.